schizophrenia is a mental disorder that affects an estimated 51 million people worldwide. The condition causes symptoms such as hallucinations, delusions, and uh, social withdrawal. And schizophrenia is incurable. It's a progressive condition in which 50% of its patients can commit suicide. Now, the biggest problem with schizophrenia is that it lacks quantification. Doctors utilize qualitative metrics and questionnaires in order to grade the severity of the condition. And this leads to late diagnostics and inaccurate prescriptions of the right treatment to suppress progression. Now, in this research, we've involved the new imaging modality of diffusion magnetic resonance imaging in order to provide quantification for schizophrenia by being able to image and model the inherent microstructures present in someone's brain. When compared to the uh, conventional fMRIs, functional MRIs that map a brain activity in a 2D space, diffusion MRI is, is conducted in a three-dimensional voxel space in which you take images from several different gradient directions, and you're able to see the extent of diffusion occurring at a specific voxel. And what does this tell us? Well, um, it, you're able to extract these values, these diffusion me measures such as fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity, which can tell you the inherent tissue integrity or degree of uh, demyelination occurring at a specific location. And this is sort of approximated using a tensor and a vectorized approximation of the eigenvectors. Now, previous studies have used these diffusion measures in order to be able to show quantified um, sort of group differences in different diseases. Um, studies have also been able to geometrically model white matter tracts um, and, and, and has been able to use that in, in sort of d disease uh, group differences. However, there have been several shortcomings with these studies, and most of all is that these studies have been largely exploratory without an end diagnostic in sight. Um, there's been no schizophrenia white matter tractography um, geometry quantification, neither has there been any localized discovery of schizophrenia tract abnormalities, and no visualizations in order to show that manifestation. Lastly, and most importantly, there's no end-to-end full-fledged diagnostic and monitoring tool for neurologists to use in order to better monitor the progression of the disease. Our research provides a solution to this issue by creating a two-step discovery and, and um, diagnostic monitoring tools uh, procedure in which we first discover several regions of risks um, that indicate high, um, if, that indicate first episode schizophrenia, and we input the, those tracked abnormalities that, we, that we've extracted into a diagnostic and monitoring tool that's capable of predicting early onset of schizophrenia, and also creating these visualizations to create a new monitoring standard for the disease. The data set used was a SIDAR data set with 30 first episode schizophrenia subjects and 30 age-matched healthy controls. The methodology of research can be split up into five distinct sections in which in the first section, we input our three-dimensional voxel data with the fourth dimensional time value for diffusion and we conduct pre-processing from this. We extract the whole brain tractography and then segment out the various pathways in that tractography. We're then able to use our new novel random force uh, analysis to be able to actually discover regions of risk in those abnormal pathways, and we use that information to conduct clustering and finally create a novel three-dimensional uh, visualization of these abnormal tracts. The image pre-processing stage required us to, we, uh, we normalized for motion, um, then corrected eddy currents, and lastly performed immediate OSU thresholds to remove background noise and get a final brain mass threshold that we can do processing off of. We first uh, then used an unscented Kalman filter in order to conduct the whole brain tractography um, in which we use these tensor ellipsoids in order to actually Use, a, use the previous directionality information in order to, in a recursive process, um, stepwise be able to track the inherent streamlines present in the whole brain tractography. And this then, through our models, we're able to generate this whole uh, tractography image that includes millions of streamlines and also their inherent diffusion measures at each and every one of their points. So then we perform white matter, we use the white matter query language algorithm in order to actually segment out this whole brain tractography into 16 different pathways, and off of the 16 common pathways from the 60 different subjects, and then we do processing on each and every one of them, in which our goal is to be able to quantify the inherent abnormalities present in these pathways, and we do that through random forests. Um, the first process in this machine learning is to do feature extraction, in which we extract four diffusion measured features. Uh, fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, uh, trace, and free water, and we extract this for each and every one of the 16 pathways, so we get a 64-dimensional feature vector for each and every subject. We then perform age factor normalization in order to regress out information of age and just focus on abnormalities present. We then train a model using this information so that we can actually make that prediction between early schizophrenia and healthy controls. 
Now, the feature extraction visualization can be seen here where the trace ellipsoids for the thalamofrontal pathway is colorized different than the fractional anisotropy seen to the right. So now in order to train our model, we use a process called bootstrap aggregation, which we created 200 weak learner classification trees that then contributed to the overall um, random force prediction model that's able to differentiate between early episode schizophrenia and healthy controls. Now, during this process, the most important part was that we were able to see what are the most important features that this random forest model is waiting when conducting that differentiation. Using the, the genie and purity model, we're actually able to see which nodes are given the highest weightage. So then we're able to find out which ones are the most abnormal pathways present in the brain. Using this genie and purity, we were able to see that there are three specific pathways that the model was giving its most weight, uh, the right cingulum frontal bundle, uh, the right stri striatum frontal bundle, and the right uh, thalma frontal bundle. So we decided to focus our uh, processing on these different abnormal pathways in which we now wanted to actually do an even more localized search. Uh, we wanted to see the specific regions that these abnormal pathways pass through and do processing on each and every one of them. We do this by using a neuronautical brain atlas and actually probe their three-dimensional information to those abnormal pathways and get these segmented regions of interest to do our processing in which we now do another feature extraction process, now with new features, um, where we've introduced streamlined geometric modeling on, on a localized scale. So now we're calculating mean curvature and mean orientation along with our previous diffusion measures. So then from this information, we train around a random forest model for each and every one of those region intersections, and we also use gene impurity to find out the most important, um, most important brain regions that are being highlighted by the model. And this, most intriguingly, the core discovery of this project was actually discovering these localized high-risk regions for first episode schizophrenia. We discovered the right thalamus, right putamen, and the right insula as the, as the areas that are having the most tracked abnormalities indicative of early onset schizophrenia. And being, being able to see that these are, are, are regions that are very close to each other, they're sharing the same tissue. And this sort of has an implication in prognostic values. And most importantly, neurologists can be, should be now be able to focus more on these tissues that since they have the most um, sort of abnormalities for schizophrenia early onset. Now we use these tracked abnormalities from these specific regions and input, inputted them into a k-means clustering model in which each and every region intersection, uh, we, we found 10 of them, we gave a score of one to four based on their inherent abnormality severity. Um, and then we did on, on a global scale on the entire whole, on, on each and every one of the region intersections, we got an aggregate 10 to 40 score based on the entire first episode schizophrenia abnormality severities. So now, the next core implication of this clustering model and the, entire, and the project as a whole was that we use this clustering information to create a novel three-dimensional pathway abnormality visualization that highlights the inherent locations where, where tracked abnormalities are indicative of early onset schizophrenia. Uh, the core, it, it, and, and by using those one to four scores, you're able to highlight those severities. Now, the core implication of something like this is that the thalamus, which is known uh, for hallucinations, a neurologist could easily see that in that region are there tract abnormalities occurring, um, and they could take the proper, uh, prog proper treatment methods by using antipsychotic drugs and targeting the drug delivery for those specific locations. So now in order to test the, the accuracies of our model, we used a K-fold cross-validation in order to be able to check how accurate those machine learning algorithms were. We used 15 uh, folds across our 60 subjects. The random force accuracies for the 16 pathway model for the general 16 pathways that were extracted was 76%. Then we performed that 82% feature reduction and just got down to those three pathways and the accuracies came down to 71%. Now, the, the model that received the highest accuracies was actually the one that used the three regions that we actually found. The, the tracked abnormalities were modeled in those three regions, and we could see that there were 78% diagnostic accuracies, um, and this is state-of-the-art for the metrics uh, of looking at pathway-by-pathway pathway abnormalities compared to the, just the general black and white threshold of do you have schizophrenia or do you not. Uh, the future box, box plot showed that curvature and FA uh, were, were measured for statistical significance. FA was uh, statistically significant, but uh, the, the curvature is something that we still need to look into in the future. In conclusion, the study has discovered three new regions of risk, the right thalamus, right putamen, and right insula, that have quantified prognostic value for schizophrenia, we achieved 78% diagnostic accuracies from the random force algorithms. We successfully created first episode schizophrenia subgroups, and we were able to cluster those groups. And most importantly, we created a three-dimensional tract abnormality visualization that provides an entirely new monitoring paradigm for early schizophrenia. 
This was all brought into a novel diagnostic and monitoring pipeline that could pre potentially prevent millions of uh, schizophrenia patients from dying uh, due to suicide because we're able to provide that quantification. In the future, we look forward to being able to modify the inherent WNQL to receive more pathways. We want to introduce more subjects, use the MRI volume data to infuse it with the inherent imaging modality, and uh, lastly, implement our diagnostic tools and our monitoring tools into clinical practice. I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Li Peng Ning, um, Dr. Martha Shenton for uh, the PI of my lab, um, Dr. Amy Silman for finding this incredible lab for me to work at uh, for the summer, Dr. Jenny Sindova, my tutor, um, the last week and first week TAs, and also um, my sponsors, uh, RSI, MIT, and CEE. Thank you. We'll now open the floor to questions from the judges. What does a, a streamline represent physically? Not in terms of how you collect the data, but physically if you like the brain anatomy or something. What does a streamline represent? Right. So the streamlines are actually a predicted version. Uh, the question was, uh, the question was, so we have the streamlines in those tractography and those beautiful images, but what do they actually represent? Now, um, the streamlines are predicted sort of direction of where are the fiber bundles located in the brain. So this is the area that the water molecules are diffusing. Um, and the, what we're doing, the streamlines are a predictive version of kind of saying that if we're able to look at each and every one of those tensor ellipsoids, we're able to find out that at each and every one of these locations, the water is diffusing in that path. But we can't exactly say that this is where neurons are passing through. But we can sort of estimate using those streamlines that this is where the fiber pathways are being restricted. This is where water is being restricted in its diffusion pathway. Um, and that's what the streamline is showing. It's giving a, a sort of approximated representation of where and how is water diffusing and, and the tissue integrity. Two interlocked questions. First is, what is the size and origin of your training data set? Um, and how, if schizophrenia is so hard to diagnose, how do you know which of your training data sets are actually classified as early schizophrenia? Okay, so the question was uh, first concerning the size of the training data set, and then secondly, how um, since these patients, uh, it's so hard to, to quantify um, which ones are, are, how did we get those per, first diagnostics? So, First of all, the subject size was we had 30 first episodes of schizophrenia and 30 healthy controls. This, the first episode for schizophrenia is sort of a given when someone has had a first psychotic episode. Uh, so whenever, um, so it's actually a pretty clear marker whether you have, uh, you're in that stage where you're starting to show symptoms of schizophrenia. So once you've had an episode of a, of a mental disorder, um, you're characterized as having schizophrenia in that first episode. So that's where those 30 subjects were then actually given that classification. I think that answer might con actually sort of confuse me. So in other words, there are many, many things that can present as a psychotic episode, including right. you know, bipolar disorder, including acute toxicity with drugs and whatnot. So was, were these based, the diagnosis was based purely on that first presentation? It wasn't based on follow-up? Yeah. yeah, so the question's about um, whether just that first episode, does that tell you schizophrenia or not? Um, so those first episode patients were actually, um, generally for the, 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 path, the way that someone is given that sort of diagnostic is that they first might have genetic information. They might have someone in their ancestry who's had schizophrenia. That's the first thing. Now, once they've had that first episode, they might then use those qualitative metrics of taking into account hallucinations, delusions, and using that information to give them that diagnostic as whether you have that first episode schizophrenia. So it's genetic information and qualitative metrics in order to give that sort of prescription. But not based on any subsequent behavior or, or for, first, for first episode, no, but then there's chronic schizophrenia that comes later on where you have different sort of uh, levels of hallucinations and that's when, they get, when they're given that new um, sort of um, prescription. And, and from one to 39 months, that's where early schizophrenia, the one to 39 months after first episode, that's when schizophrenia is, is given. I have two related questions. One is, um, uh, it looks like uh, your work helped to uh, 
understand better how to diagnose. Mm. You, you identified the area where, which is critical for diagnosis. And because of that, you can attempt this area to cure schizophrenia, schizophrenia, which is both, both are of that of the day. Is there any uh, impact on understanding of the mechanisms? I don't know, maybe mechanisms are already understood. But if people didn't know where to look exactly, maybe they didn't know how that works, why uh, you have that uh, behavior of the patient based, based on that me mechanism. Uh, that's my first question. And the second question is, it's a huge amount of work. Maybe a very impactful, and very interesting work. What was your personal, what, what, what was the area when you contribute most in that work? Okay, uh, so the, the first question, if I, if I understood you correctly, was um, about, um, okay. Okay, okay. The, okay, so I, I, yeah, I guess, um, so, under, so the first part was about like understanding those inherent mechanisms that are present um, in, in, in schizophrenia and the, so, so answering that question first, so it, it, we're not just like really doing the diagnostics here. As you said, we're actually trying to see which regions of the brains might have prognostic value to the disease. Um, and that's, that's the inherent um, underlying sort of value that this project would provide is that it, it provides, it shows those inherent locations that, that neurologists should be focusing their attention on. Um, and by the models that we've created that can quantify tract abnormalities, um, those metrics, those clustering me metrics that can tell you one to four, <coughs> It'll tell you that in those regions, what is the severity of that um, abnormality in that localized region that we've discovered. So that is the mechanism that would allow them to say that maybe we should pr provide antipsychotic drugs that are targeted for hallucinations because this is occurring in the thalamus. So th that's the inherent mechanism that we hope to be able to provide. Um, and then the second question about um, the inherent, uh, what has been provided from this study, from all this work. Um, so the, the inherent, work that's been done is that in the, the overall diagnostic tool and monitoring thing that's been created. Um, we started off with being able to make that discovery, that discovery of the right putamen, right thalamus, and the right insula was the core sort of discovery that this project was able to do because we were applied machine learning uh, to that task that is currently just, I guess, qualitatively and, and you might just use it for exploratory studies. Different. That was more personal. Okay. I was trying to understand in that huge amount of work, what was the area that you personally contributed the most? Okay. What, what is the, what was the physical thing that you were doing? Okay, I, was, I, I created, so the question was again uh, about exactly what I did. Um, I created the models, the random forest models. I, I, I performed the entire, um, I, I did white matter query language. I used that algorithm. Um, I then actually found out that these are the regions that are having the most abnormalities. I then created the clustering algorithm and uh, I also created the visualizations that show those clustering models. So I did all the computational work for this project. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you.